Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. That last part was kind of crazy, wasn't it? What? You didn't see it? Well then, I'm gonna hold on right here. I'm gonna need you to head back over to Plus Ultraman and check out part one of season two of What If Giovanni Sponsored Ash. Go on, I'll be here when you get back. But if you don't need to get caught up, then let's proceed. But before we get into today's episode, I need you to take a look at the analytic bar right here. 64.9% of you guys that watch my content are not subscribed. So if you could do me a favor and make sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications to make sure you never miss an upload from me or any of the people that I am in collab with. But without further ado, let's get into hero or villain path of the Pokemon Master. I hope you enjoy. Ash is dying, for surely this must be what death feels like. He is burning and freezing all at once, while powerful currents force his entire body into spasming. Then suddenly, there is nothing, and in contrast to the pain of the last few seconds, this void is bliss, and the young man briefly thinks that if this is to be his fate, things could certainly be worse. Then, just as suddenly, the world reappears around him, and he feels himself falling, before landing hard on cold tiled ground. In contrast to the ground, several warm things are pressed up against him now, and as Ash looks around, he sees a trio of feline figures. The first is Meowth, rubbing his head and groaning that he feels like his charm is gonna fall off. And the second is Mewtwo, burned, bruised, and barely conscious, giving Ash a wary look. And the last one is, is that the original Mew? Light then suddenly bathes our young hero, and as he shields his eyes against the artificial lights, he hears a flickering sound above him. Looking up, he sees that Mew is gone, before a female voice demands his attention. Turning to face the noise, Ash finally realizes that he is lying in a broom closet, and that the person speaking to him is watching him from its doorway. She is a girl only a little older than him with short purple hair who demands to know who he is and how he's breached her psychic barriers. Ash tries to answer, to tell her that he doesn't know who she is, where he is, or what she's talking about, but as it turns out, the act of speaking proves too much for him in his current state, and instead, he simply vomits then passes out. What happens next could have transpired over minutes, days, or years. Ash doesn't know, as he occasionally finds himself floating in and out of consciousness. With each salvo into the waking world, the young man sees or hears tidbits which make no sense to his adult mind, but fascinate him all the same. First, he sees a new woman standing over him, green-haired and lithe, telling the purple-haired girl to seal some tower and move their guests somewhere she can give them a thorough medical inspection. Ash then thinks that he is still lying in the cupboard at this point, as the next thing he knows, he is floating on his back. He seems to be moving backwards, as new lights keep appearing over him, stinging his eyes, but he is being held firmly in place, unable to even turn his head. When next he wakes, he is strapped to a gurney, as the green-haired woman's voice shrieks from out of view about needing more Ultra Balls or something. While all around him, blue psionic energy pulses as a rage that is not his own twists in his stomach. Why is this happening? Finally, he truly awakens in a large, plush bed, natural sunlight tickling his face, and this time, there are no restraints on him, either physical or psychic. Sitting up, he sees that he is not alone, as the purple-haired girl from before is perched on the end of his bed. When she sees that he is awake, she smiles genuinely, saying that it's about time he woke up, as he's been out for almost a week. Ash then groggily asks where he is and who she is, but the girl teases that he ought to slow down, otherwise he'll puke and pass out again, which would be a problem since she's out of fresh clothes in his size. Regaining some sense of himself, at least for his wit to come back, he groans that she's not going to let him forget that, is she? To which the girl chirpily replies, nope, though chuckles that with instincts like his, maybe he's psychic too. That word, psychic, psychic. Mewtwo! Frantically, Ash bolts out of bed, demanding to know where Mewtwo is, but the girl tells him to relax. Her mentor already captured it, so it can't hurt him anymore. Isolated with worry, Ash says that's not the problem, as that out-of-body fury grips him once more. Without another word, he runs on numb feet in the direction Mewtwo's rage seems to be tugging at him. Soon, he finds himself in a room with a single Ultra Ball resting on a table, and as if on instinct, Ash grabs the ball and begins hammering it into the edge of the table, with the intent to shatter it. Due to his white knuckle grip on the ball, each smash sends a jolt up his arm, but he doesn't care. Mewtwo's cries ring in his head. It has to get out. He has to get it out. Cracks start forming on the Ultra Ball, and the feeling of constriction Ash has had not even noticed on gripping his heart begins to loosen. With a sigh, he lines the ball up for one last smash. But before he can bring it down, a stern voice tells him to stop. Looking around, he sees the green-haired woman who demands to know what he thinks he is doing, letting that monster out. Angrily, Ash claims that Mewtwo isn't a monster. He's a victim of a monster, so he has to let it out. A much less angry voice then joins the conversation, that of Meowth, telling Ash to calm down so they can talk to out. It took Sabrina and all of her flunkies to catch that 
nothing. And that's while it's still banged up from New Island. Is he really sure he wants to let that thing out with no guarantee that they'll be able to recapture it if anything goes wrong? Ash says he is, and Sabrina sighs. That settles things, before psychically shoving Ash into the wall. Telekinetically, she returns Mewtwo's ball to the table, then approaches Ash, telling him he's clearly been hypnotized by Mewtwo to do his bidding. With time, it'll pass, but for now, he's not in a rational state of mind, so he can't be trusted. Ash snaps back that he's perfectly rational, a claim which makes him sound distinctly irrational, but our hero has no cares for irony at this point, glaring daggers at Sabrina and demanding she let him down. Sabrina flatly refuses, saying right now, every instinct will be telling him to do that monster's bidding and set it free. It's not his fault. He's just brainwashed. For the briefest of moments, Ash pauses, wondering if maybe Sabrina's right. That would explain this weird connection he and Mewtwo have. But then, he looks into his heart, and in that moment, he knows that he's not under any form of mind control. Now with the calm resolve, Ash tells Sabrina that Mewtwo's not controlling him, but the psychic doesn't want to hear it. Instead, calling for someone to fetch Annabelle so she can escort Ash back to his room. Ash uses this opportunity to look past Sabrina to Meowth, who is now perched on the table, and in this moment they are able to communicate without words, as Ash's eyes plead with the scratch cat to trust him. Without hesitation, Meowth nods. Then, with a flick of his tail, he nudges Mewtwo's ball off the table, causing it to hit the floor and shatter. At once, Mewtwo emerges, its rage palatable, and without hesitation or mercy, it reaches out a hand to physically lift Sabrina in the air, choking the life out of her for sealing it. The psychic specialist powers pale in comparison to the world's strongest Pokemon, and so all she can do is gasp and gargle as Mewtwo applies more pressure to her windpipe. But before the final snap can ring out, Ash cries for Mewtwo to stop. At once, Mewtwo spins to face Ash, a psychic accusation of you radiating from it. Ash always stands firm, telling Mewtwo to let Sabrina go, since she's not the enemy, she's just scared. At this, the creature pauses, then with reluctance, etched into every inch of its feline features, Mewtwo slackens his grip allowing Sabrina to hit the ground, gulping in air once more. Ash now turns his attention back to Sabrina, asking her not to react, since they'll need to talk if they're ever going to solve anything. In a ragged voice, the gym leader curses Ash, saying he's doomed them all since this abomination is pure evil, and she should know, since she grew up with the evil that created it. The woman's mind then drifts back to the events which took place before Ash had even been born, an entire 12 years ago. And due to her incredible psychic power, she is able to gently give Ash, Mewtwo, and courteously even Meowth a perception into this, as she quickly flashes them through a series of images that at first make little sense to them. A house somewhere near Saffron City, a pregnant woman and a happy man. That is, until a face they recognize appears, and it becomes quickly apparent what the story was about. As the realization that Sabrina's father made up the fourth and final member of Giovanni's first set of admins referred to as the Four Rocket Boosters, or the Command Quartet hits like a turn of bricks. Giovanni always uses connections and leverage he'd forge with those people later in important positions to force coerce, or in some cases like Sabrina's father, bribe them into service. A decision the ESP-abled father made not out of greed, but in order to provide for his family better than a gym leader's salary would allow one to at that time. And with Sabrina not being the only child their new family wanted, Giovanni had more than ample ammunition to motivate the psychic. The flashback stutters for a bit strangely, but Mewtwo nor Ash pay this any mind, wanting only to know more. This stutter, however, is caused due to surprise Sabrina feels due to being a tad overwhelmed by the flood of sympathy from those she perceives as dangerous, elicited simply by seeing that she too was cursed by their tormentor. When the memory resumes, however, this sympathy turns into true secondhand heartache as the true horror of Sabrina's life is shown as the question of how one discovers such amazing psychic powers is given an answer, not safely. With Sabrina's father as a significantly weaker yet still experienced psychic ironically absent from his family so often for the task of hunting down the legendary birds, the discovery of Sabrina's potential is unfortunately made by her incredibly ill-prepared mother, resulting in Sabrina accidentally making a mistake no one could ever atone for as the situation ends fatally. So when her father finally does return, it is only to find absolute heartbreak and despair, as essentially he lost both the most important things in his life, his wife to the cruel hands of fate, and his daughter to her own tempestuous and volatile psychic emotions, which leaves Sabrina a hollow husk, in a state much like we met her in during the events of the original anime. And on this somber note, the vision ends, leaving Ash, Sabrina, Mewtwo, and Meowth standing together in this barren room. Coldly, the psychic ass of Ash sees now why untamed powers like Mewtwo's can't be allowed to run rampant, but it is Mewtwo who speaks for itself, declaring that unlike Sabrina, it is not some tempestuous child unable to contain their own strength. Quick as a flash, Sabrina rounds on the 
artificial Pokemon, sneering that it should tell that to the dozens of Pokemon it crippled on New Island, or the hundreds before that in the Viridian Gym. Anger flashes at Mewtwo's eyes. It retorts that it was only following Giovanni's orders, though a bit of its confidence fades as he does. But Sabrina has an instant counter, stating that so was her father, and she made a promise to herself long ago that she would never again be at the mercy of someone just following orders. Psychic energy then begins to crackle around both Mewtwo and Sabrina as the latter draws out a Pokeball, clearly readying herself to battle and if possible reseal Mewtwo. However, before the first attack can be called, Ash runs between the pair, telling them to stop since they don't have to be enemies and they both have a common goal to live freely and in peace, so why can't they at least try to get along? As one, Sabrina and Mewtwo both harumph, but neither attack, allowing Ash to continue as he elaborates that they also have Giovanni. Allowing Ash to continue as he elaborates that they also have Giovanni to thank for their pain in their past. He then explains that while they were being led to their cell on New Island, Giovanni showed him, Gary, Richie, and Silver the lab they had used to clone Mewtwo, even telling them with the exception of Gary, each of their genes have been harvested and included in Mewtwo's genetic makeup. This shocks the clone, who asks if this is why they have this strange psychic link, but Ash shakes his head, saying that he doesn't know, but doesn't think so, since Mewtwo is never linked with any of the others. His working theory is that when Crocodile broke Mewtwo's armor, all the psychic power and emotion that the armor had been keeping in finally had an outlet, so maybe it rushed into the first person Mewtwo laid eyes on, which was him. At this, Mewtwo only sighs that whether right or wrong, it does nothing to change the situation they're in. The boy agrees, but any further discussion is cut short by the arrival of Annabelle, who unsurprisingly flowers when she sees Mewtwo out of his ball and Ash seemingly aiding and abetting. Calling out her espion, she tells her to get ready, but Ash urges her to stop, saying that Mewtwo won't attack her unless she attacks first. Mewtwo sees that he shouldn't make promises for them, since they have no interest in this human safety. This is all the justification that Annabelle needs, saying that Mewtwo is clearly dangerous, and so the pair take up a fighting pose just as Mewtwo did with her mentor. However, once again, Ash is able to quell Mewtwo's rage, this time by laying a comforting hand on their forearm. This is of great interest to Sabrina, who tells Annabelle to come with her as she swans out of the room, telling her protege that they have something to discuss of the utmost importance. The younger Esper follows dutifully, and so the pair of women depart, leaving Ash, Meowth, and Mewtwo in the room alone. Meowth takes this opportunity to scamper onto his favorite perch, that being Ash's shoulder, and the boy in turn scratches his head, smiling that he's glad Meowth is alright. The cat chuckles that it may have cost one of his nine lives to get Ash out of that cell, but it's all worth it to be back in his boss's good books, and out from under the thumb of that creep Giovanni. Ash nods, but Mewtwo rather fatalistically says that Giovanni will find them again, and when he does, he'll punch them all harshly. Ash encourages them to lighten up, since for now they're free and they're safe. Mewtwo growls at this thinking he's short-sighted, but Meowth quips that they all can't be psychic, you know. Anger still burning, Mewtwo says it doesn't need input from a slave, causing Meowth to scowl that he's no one's slave. Coolly, the psychic Pokemon asks if he gives the Scratch Cat commands, and if Meowth obeys those commands. Meowth nods that he is in that case and Mewtwo coldly states that in that case, he is a slave. Ash protests that his Pokemon are friends, not slaves, with Meowth agreeing that Ash treats him and the others with love as equals. Mewtwo scoffs that a prized slave is still a slave nonetheless, then, without words, floats away. Despite losing sight of the psychic type, their connection allows Ash to know where it has gone, and so after giving it some time to simmer down, he and Meowth ride an elevator down to the lower level. Here, they find Mewtwo hovering in the center of the battlefield, deep contemplation etched on its face. Ash asks what is wrong, and Mewtwo, temper having cooled a bit, says that he's trying to understand the appeal of battle. Ash is confused, saying his battle before. In fact, it's an incredible battler, but Mewtwo rebuts that in the past, when it battled, it was either on the whim of others, or like on New Island, for the sake of survival. The idea of battles as a sport, a form of entertainment, that is what eludes Mewtwo, just as much as the claim that a trainer can both love their Pokemon and subjugate them for battle. Showing a bit of maturity, Ash recognizes the validity of Mewtwo's point, as his experience with humanity in general has been overwhelmingly negative. So, it's not surprising that he would write certain things off as a whole. However, he tries to explain the difference between battles for sport and just plain violence, stating that the goal of a battle is to render the opponent unable to continue. Forcing them to faint from damage overload is an option, obviously, but some trainers work their entire lives to create flawless battle strategies that are able to defend opponents as quickly and harmlessly as possible. At the same time, there are others, and with a bit of guilty chuckle, he has to admit that he too can be considered part of this camp, who just like seeing their Pokemon get stronger so they can blow stuff up in cooler ways, though he'd definitely grown out of that, at least a little bit. Mewtwo, however, cuts in and states that Ash has missed a type of battler, the kind who simply enjoys suffering for suffering's sake and increases their power solely for that reason. Ash pauses, but nods agreeing that those guys are certainly out there. If his journey has shown him anything, it is that those people are certainly in the minority. The same way Pokemon are completely unique individually and can have their own hopes, dreams, fears, 
fears and ambitions is the same for humans. Meow suddenly states this is the first and last time he hopes to hear his boss trying to be philosophical, earning him a glare from the boy, and to his utter delight, a small noise in his head that he recognizes as Mewtwo holding in laughter. Sighing, Ash says that he isn't asking Mewtwo to seriously work to develop some weird undying love for all of humanity, just to judge humans as individuals the way we did with Pokemon. The clone, after a moment of thought, admits that this is an acceptable request, but makes no promise. The trio fall into silence until Mewtwo seems to get bored first and suddenly asks Meowth why he walks and talks like a human. The Scratch Cat is all too happy to give his backstory, though while he does, Ash begins to think about all the things he's been saying and suddenly jumps to his feet, dancing around excitedly as he nearly does a cartoon character peel out while rushing off to find Sabrina having totally forgotten the opportunity being around her presents. Though after wandering the halls of the Battle Tower in vain for a while, he begins to wish he'd gotten more out of his psychic link than just the ability to sense Mewtwo. But then he recognizes that he really hasn't tried to do anything more. Closing his eyes, he begins to focus, and he could indeed still vaguely sense Mewtwo growing closer to him no doubt curious as to why he got so excited. But now that he's actually feeling for it, there is something else, however. Nothing as powerful as Mewtwo, obviously, but still a presence he can sense within himself. Focusing on it harder causes him to begin to strain a bit. Then suddenly, he hears Meowth calling for him as he begins to scamper up his shoulder. Unfortunately, this startles Ash, causing him to loosen his grip on the presence and jump in surprise, causing the sensation he felt to reveal its origin at the worst possible time, as he accidentally ends up passing gas right into Meowth's face. The Scratch Cat, though, knows this suddenly stiffens and reels away in disgust while screaming, comedically resulting in his both bonking his head and biting his tongue, causing him to angrily begin cursing both the hard floor, his hard teeth, and his unhoused trained boss, while he lisped that Crocodile and Charizard have better manners than him, causing the two partners to begin bickering in a ridiculously childish way until three voices in tandem ask what on earth they are doing. Blinking, the two look to see Mewtwo, Annabelle, and the still fairly intimidating Sabrina currently staring at it. Whatever this is, and causing Ash to sweat drop and lamely explain his experiment gone wrong, there is a tense pause until to both Ash and Meow's delight, the three powerful psychics slowly burst into a roar of laughter, finding it refreshing to hear Mewtwo relaxing first and foremost, but also recognizing on some level the small showing of Meowth and Ash's genuinely close yet, at times, silly bond may have improved Annabelle and Sabrina's impressions of him. However, as the laughter lingers a bit too long, his delight tarnishes slightly, and he fumes that it isn't that silly of him to think that he may be a psychic now after all that had happened. Regardless, he levels a finger at Sabrina while producing his badge case, and showing its contents stating his challenge for her gym badge as Ash Ketchum of Palatown, strongest trainer to be sponsored by the great J- He pauses, a scowl crosses his face, and all present notice his vibe wavers slightly, until he closes his eyes and takes a deep breath, skipping the fanfare and stating the basics. He wanted to be the best, so that meant going through her. Sabrina eyes the boy up and down before looking to Mewtwo, whose good mood seems to have wavered the near mention of Giovanni. It doesn't take her long to realize Ash's request is not as selfish as it seems, and a smirk crosses her lips as she accepts her challenge, but states she will only battle him on one condition, making it a one-on-one -on -one battle with their strongest Pokemon. No gym leader limitations either. This is the battle tower. The rules of Saffron City's gym does not apply here, though she can bestow one at her discretion. Without Without hesitation, Ash gratefully accepts, having hoped she'd say something like that. Annabelle, in genuine interest to witness such a battle, actually goes to the trouble of full-on having Espeon help her teleport their group to the battlefield, a bit rudely leaving Mewtwo on his own, since she for one wasn't sure if he wanted to watch, or if he would be insulted by someone else doing so for him without asking. However, to her surprise, the clone appears in the battle area soon after, and mutters something about trivial violence in their minds as he takes to floating far above the furthest end of the viewing stands, while lazily leaning back and turning kind of halfway so he could glance toward the battlefield or stare at the apparently more interesting wall. Was it just Annabelle? Or was this intimidating creature known as the world's strongest Pokemon beginning to seem more innocently childish the longer he was around this boy? Pushing the thought aside, she announces herself as the battle's referee, then quickly restates the terms of the battle, then has Sabrina as the gym leader bring out her Pokemon first. The hero of Kanto announced it as her first and most mighty friend, the great and powerful Merlin, as an Alakazam takes the field, not from a Pokeball, but by teleporting into the room from who knows where, as she goes to the trouble of dusting snow off herself, quickly alerting Ash that these two share a bond strong enough for Sabrina to be comfortable with letting her partner roam free, and then teleporting in at a moment's notice like that. This is a whole new class of speed that Ash has never dealt with, outside of maybe Mewtwo that is, and this excites him. Hailed by a call of I choose you, Crocodile slams onto the field with a heavy thud and crosses his arms while sizing up the rather diminutive psychic type in front of him, and then glances back to give Ash a toothy grin as if to ask if they're finally back on the grind for their main goal. The trainer smiles back and asks for his friend to make sure he enjoys his battle, just for the sake of it, as he'd realized that ever since evolving in Viridian Gym, his first 
Pokemon hadn't actually had a casual battle. Just like he'd been saying, they're all free now, so it's time they start acting like it. Then grinning, he calls for Crocodile to go as wild as he pleases, encouraging the Croc to where he eagerly dashes forward just as Annabelle starts the match. Exactly as he'd feared though, Sabrina and Merlin instantly have the advantage of non-verbal and extremely fast commands, as the Spoon Wielder pops out of existence and reappears directly in front of Crocodile in the blink of an eye, now accompanied by an orb of orangish white energy formed and charging between her spoons. Ash and Crocodile's eyes in unison widen in shock, as it's already too late for either to react, leaving the Croc open to the blast slamming into him point blank and kicking up a cloud of dust. Sabrina then verbally reminds Ash about her warning before the battle, then bragging that that was one of Merlin's specialties, the instant teleportation focus blast, confirming for him that winning this battle means beating someone faster than the speed of thought. Since as a gym leader and a protector of this region, Sabrina must ensure that this boy is up to snuff for the responsibilities the power he has attained comes with. As the smoke clears a bit, Ash grins that he wouldn't have it any other way. The trainers are finally able to see that Crocodile is currently glowing with a similar colored energy of revenge, and had not only resisted the attack extremely well, but nearly gotten a dangerous hold on such a frail Pokemon. Thankfully for Merlin, Sabrina is capable of multitasking, having had her partner erect a reflect barrier directly after launching her first attack. Both trainers then take on wild grins at the challenge the battle presents, before both ordering their follow-ups of Stone Edge and Dazzling Gleam, illuminating the gym with flashes of the Pokemon silhouettes among the jagged rocks and energy blasts being lobbed around. Mewtwo is disinterested. He really is. However, he can't help but sneak glances constantly. It's just too hard not to. How? There isn't any mouse between the Pokemon or their trainers. Even that dark type creature, whose mind was already incredibly difficult to sense, was clearly only having fun. They all were, and strangely, though the sensation was foreign to him, watching the battle seemed to cause the same from him. Or at the very least, he is able to recognize the allure of battles, as he witnesses the clashing of different ideologies of fighting or battle styles as Ash had called them, becoming especially engrossed with the moments where the combatants create an infinite amount of possibilities as to what they can do next considering so many factors. Also the admirability in how each Pokemon Pokemon and trainer duo have worked to compensate for their weaknesses and exemplify their strengths as a team. Kinda cool, ain't it? The clone suddenly turns his gaze back to the wall he'd been trying to stare at to see that Meowth had actually left Ash's side in order to very dangerously scale it in order to talk to Mewtwo. While training has made the cat stronger and more athletic, he is still not meant to scale a perfectly 90 degree metal wall, and he quickly begins to slip and lose his balance, if not for Mewtwo sighing and levitating the cat in his oar to view the battle alongside him. First off reminding that he could have way more easily spoken telepathically from the ground, and then asking him to elaborate what he means by cool. Meowth says that he watched Ash come from rock bottom to where he is now, as the duo view Crocodile narrowly avoiding a barrage of focus blasts by diving under the ground and attempting a whack a diglet technique to varying success, and reminds they actually got to see Sabrina's origins. The two Pokemon they're battling with obviously means a lot to both trainers, and you can almost feel the bond and power radiated off of them, and Meowth isn't even psychic. Mewtwo is still confused though. While committing acts of violence at all, interesting though it may be, is it truly productive? or is it not dangerous? Meowth agrees that he's right and wrong. Everything is really unproductive and dangerous if you really stop and split hairs. Bringing up one time when he'd seen a Meowth from his old neighborhood get scooped up by a Noctowl and carried away. One of the scariest things he had ever seen, he swears to Arceus and even shivers at the memory as Sabrina and Merlin turn the tables by making being underground hazardous. Merlin uses Psychic on the ground and dirt of the gym instead to pack it in and tighten it, virtually making it so Crocodile is forced to to swim through the ground of a planet with a higher gravity, eventually using this to locate and trap Crocodile in a tightly condensed cocoon of sand. This development even pausing the feline's aerial conversation, as Sabrina, with a bit of sweat on her brow and a still insanely happy grin, demands to know what Ash will do now. Merlin can surely impart more force on his partner's prison. It would result in a knockout, but she'd likely break something to do it, and she knows Ash doesn't want his friend hurt. Encouraging him for an amazing battle, she suggests that Annabelle call the match, but to her her surprise, the referee is currently staring at Ash, whose eyes are closed tightly as they seem to once again be focusing on something. Meowth says that if the boss farts again, he's quitting, but instead Ash's eyes burst wide as a hazy aura seems to leak off of him, almost giving the appearance that Crocodile is at his side rather than trapped. And speaking of the Croc's prison, it too begins to grow an angry red, suddenly exploding as Crocodile breaks free, now cloaked in the same Dragonic energy. Lance's Dragonite had once sent it flying with him the form of outrage. Mewtwo's Mew dampens, and he scoffs that he knew this would come down to an act of savagery, but Meowth sternly tells him to keep watching if he wants to see Ash's answer, though he himself is also on the edge of his proverbial psychic energy based seat. Crocodile, who's moved comparatively sluggishly until this point, suddenly becomes extremely rambunctious, pursuing Merlin as she continues teleporting and firing off pot shots from a distance while tearing them all apart with his Dragonic Ganger. However, he suddenly stops and begins to look around in confusion.
confusion, a moment Sabrina had been waiting for, as she orders Merlin to finish it with dazzling gleam. However, instead of panic, Ash merely speaks Crocodile's name in his usual friendly tone, and the croc seems to instantly snap out of it, erecting a stone edge barrier to just barely hang on. But Sabrina allows no more resistance, as she telepathically orders a reflect to be erected behind Crocodile, trapping him for a final of full power instant teleportation focus blast with all she has left. But again, Ash perfectly counters in the most straightforward way as he simply has Crocodile bat the blast away and this time successfully catch Merlin as he gets a hold of the whiskers, causing Merlin to flinch and freeze up in fear as her fragile nature has always made her very weak to physical moves and she can feel the force that the croc can put out with only one bite. Her trust is awarded, however, because as soon as that feeling of fear races across Merlin's massive brain, Sabrina graciously concedes the battle. In total shock, Mewtwo questions what just happened. Crocodile shakily drops to one knee, and the energy around Ash fades without his notice while he runs to hate his friend. Meowth admits that he has no idea, and then points out that life got a lot weirder when Mewtwo got involved, so it's a bit unfair for him also to be in the dark so often. But what he does know, if there was one lesson that Ash taught him, it was that true strength is the power to keep going until the very end no matter what. So whatever was happening now must be a product of that. There are bad people in the world. And more often than not, they hurt good people and force them to do violent things just like the bad people. But the cat also recognizes that there are good people who just want to know their own strength. To Meowth, that had always meant that violence is a part of balance, in a way that peace really can't exist without it, allowing him to circle back to the story of the Meowth and the Noctowl, and pointing out that inevitably Pokemon have to commit certain acts of violence as well in order to survive. They'd done so before humans existed, and would continue to do so even if they were to disappear. As he watches while Ash is awarded the Marsh Badge, Mewtwo muses over Meowth's wisdom, before floating the two of them back to the ground. It has been a few days since Ash's gym battle. He, his team, and even Mewtwo have adjusted much better in the move from their very drab temporary living quarters in the battle tower to the older girl's much more comfortable and surprisingly large house. Speaking of Annabelle, now that she's gotten some time to actually interact with and observe Ash, even when he thinks no one is watching, she finds herself able to relax a lot more around him. At one point, being a tad surprised, she is almost three years his senior, as his interactions with Mewtwo, as well as both his own Pokemon and hers, at time give the impression of the opposite. Well, except for Meow, as the duo seem to somehow both share the same Alakazam tier mind at some times, and possibly half of the mental faculties available to a Slowpoke at others. Regardless of such a genuine love between trainer and Pokemon means that at his core, the boy has a lot of good, even though his aura on closer inspection has been tinged by a great trauma. This causes Annabelle to try to make her home as welcoming and comfortable as possible for her guests. But because the Frontier Brain isn't running a Pokemon Center, she does have Ash pick up the slack and pull his weight. Something he is all too happy to do as household chores now feel like an excitingly mundane treat now that life has become so hectic. Not to mention, she'd really done a lot and stuck her neck out for him, so playing the role of Annabelle's butler seems like the least he could do in return. But other than a few responsibilities, he is carefree and can simply relax and do things like play with his Pokemon or take care of his egg. Which, now that he'd gotten the go-ahead to keep it from the Royal Combat that was Brock, he had already begun to become very attached to and protective of. At one point, even being caught whispering my precious to it over and over again in a very weird voice by Annabelle. It however isn't all relaxation, as Annabelle is for all intents and purposes currently the master of his training as well as his temporary home, having been tasked by her own mentor to serve as a guide for the younger boy. Their goal being to help him connect with Mewtwo in such a way that his claim of being able to keep the clone Pokemon in line would be more realistic. This work is slow at first, as the clone Pokemon initially takes a lot of offense to the idea of being trained, however Annabelle specifies that this training isn't about any kind of strength or power up or obedience or something that menial. It's about making sure Mewtwo can form a non-antagonistic connection with humanity. Both Ash and Mewtwo Mewtwo currently stand on separate islands, so to speak. So their goal, separate to Sabrina's and her own, is to build a bridge. When asked how exactly they do this, Annabelle shrugs and admits she can't tell them, since it's different for everyone. After face falling and being asked by Mewtwo what he's doing, Ash demands to know what Annabelle means, and she admits that this goal isn't one she can really help them achieve, since she has no idea what it will take to earn Mewtwo's trust, and more importantly, isn't the one he seems to have given such an opportunity to. All she can do is facilitate by providing a safe and private place, but beyond that, she's only good for supervising and trying to prevent the worst case scenario. Instead of questioning what that scenario entails, Mewtwo's aura darkens a bit as memories from New Island haunt him still, but Ash's presence seems to quickly soothe him. Smiling warmly at this, Annabelle states that as Ash may have figured by his connection to Blaine and Surge, in general, it really isn't as rare to run into legendary Pokemon as some may think. And while it has always been true that some of the most powerful and influential people of this world's history have met, befriended, or even subjugated legendary Pokemon in the past, there's little to prove that this does not still hold true for the trainers of today. Even Brad 
bragging that it was with the help of a legendary Pokemon that her hero Sabrina was able to save the Kanto region from Team Rocket in the first place. Bonds like these have always been a vital resource at times and a necessary evil at others, since we've learned a majority of what we currently know about these mysterious Pokemon from them, like that some legendary Pokemon reproduce like more common species, while some do not, and have existed longer than humanity can even fathom. This in turn means that a lot more is known, at least in the allegiances and ambitions of those Pokemon, as opposed to their simply being assumed as unapproachable and immortal gods like in the world's past. Kanto's legendary birds, for example, really only act in accordance with their own will fitting for kings of the sky to act freely and roam the world as they see fit. Or in the case of the numerous sightings of Johto's often deified phoenix or guardian leviathan of the world seas, they overwhelmingly recount those creatures as being just and benevolent, even aided by the legendary beasts which roamed Johto's lands and were once feared and outcast by its people, that are now beloved as guardians by many around the world. Whereas with cases like the titans currently lying dormant in the Hoenn region, they are said to only be motivated by their goal of expanding their domains, and humanity nor other Pokemon have really ever interested them. She then digresses before going on a tangent about all the world's legends to summarize that Mewtwo is a complete mystery to everyone, so anything Ash learns will be something the world learns, and any connection he makes will also hopefully be one the world makes with Mewtwo. Above all else, understanding between parties is crucial, and may be the only key to changing Mewtwo from the villain that once threatened Kanto, to a hero that may be just what it and the world needs. The clone huffs at the lecture and asserts that he still finds this demeaning, asking if humans ever hold one another captive when they seek to make bonds. The brain apologizes, but for now, she, Lady Sabrina, and all of her other Esper gym trainers would be forming a barrier to keep Mewtwo confined to only her home or the battle tower, at least as long as they can while the creature continues to heal. But she chooses not to mention that. Sighing, he turns to Ash and expresses that he does want to learn more from him. Their bond by estimation couldn't be a product of merely the random alignment of DNA or coincidence. There was something he could discover only through Ash, to which the preteen nods and extending his hand accepting that it was certainly true for him as well. This change in attitude makes Mewtwo much more willing to try things Ash's way as they begin to go smoother with each day that passes. In every new experience with Ash, the discovery of fun is a true joy for Mewtwo. Like the time Ash requests he take him flying, as the boy wondered how it differed from doing so with Firo or Charizard, though both of them make a discovery from this experience. For Ash, he confirms that Mewtwo really does operate on an almost entirely different concept of speed, and for Mewtwo, he learns that Ash can turn a great many shades of green. He also learns what a practical joke is after Ash convinces him to try using his teleportation to bother Annabelle while she is at work. Thankfully, things like this also lead to a vital lesson for the clone of Mew, such as why it's rude to read one's mind before asking, or to suddenly pop into a room without checking if it's okay first. It is through these shared experiences that indeed a bond is formed, and as Annabelle said, it was done on their own terms. However, she does state that their training still has a final step. She doesn't think she's ready to give them yet. Not to mention it slowly becomes very clear that Mewtwo is enjoying applying some of the things he's learned from watching Ash and Sabrina's battle in training with Ash's team. And more importantly, seems to take genuine pride in trying to help each of them bring out their powers to their fullest potential. This development does, however, bring to question a serious issue. Ash is still unable to access Gloom from her Pokeball, as she is his seventh member. And though it seems far from hatching, his egg will mark his eighth when that time does come. If Giovanni won't be his sponsor any longer, he'll need to find someone else to take care of his Pokemon when he isn't traveling with them. The issue is that's both expensive and risky. As much as he'd like to, it would be an unwanted burden to ask Annabelle or Sabrina to do so, seeing as how they'd already done much more than enough for him. And in his opinion, both his mom and Professor Oak were out, since it's always possible the Rockets may retaliate against his family, Pokemon, or friends to get him, and so he needs to stay away from them until he gets a solution figured out. Meow, sensing this, simply suggests they have Annabelle steal Gloom for now. The function they're fighting right now is practically a product of the Pokedex, but it's also a lock system built into the balls that syncs with the trainer's ID. It's meant to keep a trainer from being able to carry more Pokemon than the authorized amount. However, Annabelle just swipes Gloom's ball in order to free her, and let her at least get some exercise or eat. That at least solves the problem without forcing one of their friends to always be perpetually locked up with no escape. This idea is thankfully very effective, and Annabelle is all happy to help, as Gloom can only only aid in training. With that settled, training also becomes a source of a lot of fun and educational activities for Mewtwo, like challenging Firo and Charizard to extremely high speed and high altitude races, or helping Hitmonlee practice his power by allowing it to hammer away at reflect barriers thick enough to resemble stone slabs, to get itself used to its new springy body and immense power, eventually helping it learn to condense its attacks into an all-out focus barrage for the move close combat. They take immense interest in helping both Crocodile and Meowth in learning how to manipulate their natural energies for attacks like swift or foul play as it forces the inherently good 
nifty creature to actually consider how they themselves do so before they can instruct others. And then again when it comes to how to convert those energies into types that are not one's own. As a clone of a Pokemon that can learn any move, Mewtwo seems to be an amazing teacher for this, leading to some interesting developments in terms of Crocodile's mastery over revenge and the newly acquired Outrage, and to Meow's truly mastering Swift and learning his first real attack since Misty's tutoring of it. Crocodile as a dark type being around is also a big help, but Mewtwo is able to show Meow how to convert the power of his slashes to the dark type, using his negative energy rather than the naturally positive that his normal typing usually calls for, in order to perform a Night Slash. This development for the Scratch Cat also leads to Mewtwo recognizing that Meowth has a hidden power he has yet to tap into, and expresses his desire to learn more about it. Ash and Meowth wave this off as likely just being Meowth's super rare ability and technician, but Mewtwo doesn't seem convinced. Gloom presents Mewtwo the challenge of dealing with a creature with confidence issues, and to Ash and Meowth's great delight, their friend seems to get a very large confidence boost when Mewtwo assures her fears of an undesirable appearance are unfounded by mentioning that she is as she was intended to be. As long as she is happy with herself, then all is good, and Ash didn't even have to teach him that one either. This seems to invigorate Gloom into accepting herself, at least by some degree more than she had for a very long time. Ash's measure, even accepting that there really is beauty in the poison typing, seems to have positive effects, as their pretty poison attacks seems to gain some serious upgrades, with the demolishing of the mental blocks no longer being limited to a mere poison powder, but now becoming a much more effective use of the move Toxic, that spreads further than a heavier powder ever could. However, now the challenge will be to keep the move as aesthetically pleasing as Gloom strove to make the move's first iteration. While Mewtwo thinks that the key may live in Gloom's access to the fairy type energy, Charizard also presents an interesting conundrum, as he essentially has the opposite issue of too much pride. As the clone Pokemon bears witness to the rivalry between the two reptiles of Ash's team, he sees Crocodile take the lead again in their ongoing score as practice battles end in Crocodile's favor, thanks to his resistance to the vast majority of his rival's techniques, as well as Charizard's refusal to use his one advantage in mobility. Ash, after a quick explanation of his Fire Lizard's backstory, explains that Crocodile has always been a rather sore spot for the native Kanto starter, but outside of battles with its rival, it's always been willing to adapt to whatever strategy to win. Now, though, it looks like he only wants to beat Crocodile straight up by overpowering it, and that just doesn't seem possible to Ash right now. Mewtwo scoffs at this, and states that this is merely a matter of pride blinding his friend, and then asks to be left alone with the fire type to speak. Having come to trust Mewtwo deeply, Ash grants this. While alone, Mewtwo simply says, let it out, and Charizard tilts his head in confusion, but Mewtwo again says to let his emotions out, revealing that he doesn't need to read its mind to know never beating one's rival even once must be really frustrating, so he again prods Charizard to let its feelings out. The lizard simply blows smoke unimpressed. But after a moment, hot tears begin to well in his eyes, and he trembles with frustration and feelings of inadequacy, and then suddenly releases the bottled up emotion filled flamethrower right into the sky, as they drip down his face before evaporating, while Mewtwo expresses that he is sure Ash has never made the lizard feel as if he will be defined by his wins or his losses, but can sympathize that his former trainer seems like the kind of person he once assumed all humans were. He then has to ask the question, does Charizard dislike Crocodile? And to this, the lizard vehemently denies and passionately roars the opposite, as he has a great respect for the croc as a warrior. He just doesn't want to be the second to nab Barry. Mewtwo finally makes a happy noise and asks Charizard to close its eyes and to focus on that feeling when it thinks of Crocodile. Instead of its frustration, focus on that respect and admiration, and then reach out towards his goal. Having come this far, Charizard obeys and tries to do so, focusing his mind on his goal of surpassing his rival rather than his anger or frustration with his own weakness. Mewtwo then hums again and tells Charizard to quickly open his eyes, and he does so, only to see his extended claw is currently glowing with a brilliant blue as Mewtwo congratulates him just as it fizzles out, suggesting that if Charizard can get a handle on Focus Punch, then he'll have an ultimate weapon against Crocodile to even the playing field with. He also leaves the lizard with the advice to not disrespect his rival by not using his wings since that technically wasn't going all out, and with this guidance, Charizard actually scores his first ever win over his rival in a true upset bout during one of their spars, and thus nearly tying their record back up. And finally, it's Psyduck, whom Mewtwo takes the greatest interest in, stating that he above all of Ash's Pokemon has an insane amount of hidden potential just waiting to be tapped into. But when Ash asks if this is really the case, he receives no response, as the clone and the dopey duck simply stare blankly at each other, and then they keep staring for days, to the point Ash and Annabelle get worried. Though about three days into this, Mewtwo finally moves again, though it is to double over in laughter, as Psyduck does the same beating and kicking on the ground while laughing in hysterics. Ash asks what on earth is going on 
on as Mewtwo is confused how he can't tell the two of them have been in an extremely intense training, remarking if he were to try this kind of mental training with any of Ash's other Pokemon, they would simply had done more harm than good while Psyduck here has taken it in stride, stating he's a wonderful student. Sweat dropping, Ash awkwardly states that that sounds great, even though to him it just looked like a three day staring contest. He then questions what's so funny causing Mewtwo to chuckle and Psyduck to go into hysterics again while Meowth and Ash glance at one another. Mewtwo apologizes, but admits that Psyduck is quite possibly the funniest creature he's ever met, Pokemon or human, and that he told the clone Pokemon a joke, which was truly too funny to control himself. This intrigues Ash, and he asks to hear the joke, which causes Psyduck to sweat drop and shrug in embarrassment. Mewtwo dents to the duck's plight, however, encourages him to go ahead and tell the joke to Ash in the way they'd been practicing. Ash tilts his head until a nervous and nasally voice recites a rather vulgar joke in his mind, stunning Ash for several reasons. Psyduck quacks a nervous chuckle as Ash looks between he and Mewtwo and takes a deep breath while pinching his nose, stating that number one, he's very proud, and number two, he needs them both to never, ever say any part of that joke again, especially around Annabelle, Sabrina, Misty, his mom, really just any woman or anyone ever. He then glares at Meowth, who is all of a sudden whistling casually as he has a strong hunch who's spreading the foul language on his team, but nonetheless encouraging Mewtwo and Psyduck to keep up this training, as its results are already showing, as he sees Psyduck attempting to float like Mewtwo, using confusion for the first time as well. The days nearly blur like this, fun and memorable, until Ash knows it, an entire two months have passed him by, as both his 11th birthday and the Pokemon League near. While by no means having been unproductive, he does feel fairly antsy since he still needs two more official badges to make his entry into the Indigo League official, and he's only got about a month left to do so, bringing up all kinds of tough decisions on what his next move shall be. He is well aware that everyone has gotten stronger, but still, the feeling of stagnation is irritating. He doesn't get to dwell on it very long, however, as Mewtwo with Meowth riding on his shoulder teleports into the room. He is currently watching old league footage in and petting Annabelle's Espeon, having come to truly enjoy it and its master's company over his stake. Ash asks what's up, and the clone in a tense tone asks Ash to come with him before teleporting him away, along with Meowth and himself, before Ash can even answer. Suddenly, the boy goes from reclining to floating high above the ocean as the sunset shimmers off the surface, and the jarring and quick change makes him lose cool for a moment, as well as the bowl of popcorn he had been enjoying. He demands to know what Mewtwo is thinking, but the creature stoically snarks that he's surprised Ash can't feel the pure malice and fear raiding from this location. Ash focuses on what he's talking about, and finally recognizes what they are. He'd known Annabelle's home was a lot further into Johto's territory than Kanto, as she had mentioned being near the Tojo Falls, but this was a lot further into his homeland's sister region than he had ever been. Evidenced by Meowth stating that this place is near Blackthorn City, commonly called the Dragon's Den, he points his paw down to a stretch of ocean that is currently being plagued by a mass of whirlpools. When the last lights of the sun disappear over the horizon, a small shipping vessel sails full speed towards the nest of whirlpools. Upon a closer look, its occupants are a small crew of rough and rugged looking sailors accompanied by very obviously ill-treated Pokemon as the ship magically navigates the whirlpools like it's done so hundreds of times before. Then, all of a sudden, its crew begin to throw nets and harpoons into the ocean depths, and as soon as they do, the ship comes under attack by a large group of Pokemon lurking under the waves. Ash, horrified by this brutal sight, asks what they're doing, but he is all too aware even before Mewtwo fiercely growls poaching in his mind. Even Meowth is completely serious and disgusted by the sight, as to their horror nets full of small and slightly larger blue water type Pokemon Ash thinks are Horsey and Seedra are tugged onto the boat's deck, but these creatures don't seem to interest the poachers, as they are only roughly inspected before being thrown back into the water. However, when they haul up two much larger Pokemon in the form of the fully grown Kingdra skewered by Machoke thrown harpoons, their goal becomes very clear, as the crew begins to cheer and strip the creatures of their valuable dragon scales, while their crewmates defend them from the last currently remaining and very enraged Kingdra currently leading the Horsey and Seedra to defend their home. Ash furiously demands to know why Mewtwo hasn't acted, but Meowth scolds him, asking how he can't see Mewtwo is only holding himself back because of everything they've been through. This tension causes Mewtwo to admit that this event has apparently been going on for a while, though the clone had purposely tried to ignore it in hopes that the Pokemon could defend themselves. Apologizing profusely, Ash curses his own selfishness at having been so lazy. Here Mewtwo is busy being babysat with him until they complete Annabelle's test, when he could be out in the world doing a lot of good. After a moment, the boy steals himself and asks to be taken down. The sailors are then shocked by the arrival of the trio, as Ash immediately asks Mewtwo to teleport all these men's Pokemon away and inform them they can do as they please from now on. As all their leverage suddenly disappears, one of the men threatens the boy by pointing his scaling knife at Ash, but Meowth instantly snatches the tool with Thief and then casually cuts it into pieces with a single slash, causing all the men to lose heart in the face of this insanity, as Ash asks one question, can they swim? 
A few minutes later, Ash, Meowth, and Mewtwo float just above the surface of the water. As they watch, the now sunken ship's crew swim for their lives, away from Ash, and back out to open ocean, away from civilization. The boy apologizes to the two Pokemon, but he simply cannot bring himself to take the life of another human, though he holds no hopes for those men to survive after witnessing such horrors. There is the hope that maybe living through something like this would be a kick in the pants they need to change their lives. Mewtwo, however, states that this is nothing to apologize for, as in truth, he feels the same way when it comes to Pokemon. Meowth, however, waves this off, simply saying that trash is trash, human or Pokemon. He'd rather allow the great Arceus to sort that kind of thing out than worry about it himself. Ash scoffs and calls out his friend for trying to sound cool like Mewtwo, which causes the two to bicker as Mewtwo sighs and prepares to teleport them back to a likely very worried Annabelle. But before they do, a gently water gun suddenly splashes across the psychic barrier, holding them aloft and drawing their attention to the head of a Kingdra looking up at them with a solemn gaze. It only takes a second to recognize it as the one in which had fought back against the poachers the hardest. Ash apologizes for their not arriving to help earlier and says that the Draconic Seahorse's herd should be safe from here on out before giving Mewtwo the signal to take them back. But Kingja cries for them to wait, and a quick translation from both his companions reveals to Ash that Kingdra wants to join him, as it reveals that it had evolved into a Kingdra only a while before the poachers first came. But he was quickly hailed as the next best option for a leader of their herd, and even challenged the current leader for the honor since he felt that his old age and trust of the people of Blackthorn City had blinded him to the possibility that as more and more humans occupy the city at the edge of their waters, the more likely it is tragedy can strike. He was even convincing enough to get a great number of his herds, Horsey and Cedra, to support him, but was always unable to defeat the Elder, whose experience far outclassed the young Sea Dragon. After presenting resistance to remaining in the Dragon's Den and challenging for leadership one time too many, King Drew was banished from the herd, though it still stuck close by. It spent its time trying to track down and defeat the poachers, but was never strong enough to do so without putting its own life in danger and retreating in fear. Now understanding a bit of Kingdra's shame, Ash asks how it feels about the former chief, as he can only assume it had already fallen to one of these raids. The boy and his team look on as Kingdra's ruby eyes soften, and it tells Meowth that now, it just feels sorry for the old leader. Disagree or not, he had always done his best for the herd and should have been allowed to live out the rest of his life without the responsibility of his protection. It is then Mewtwo who asks if Kingdra is really alright leaving when the herd needs a new chief now more than ever. But Kingdra instantly says that it is, explaining that his first and last decree as the new chief was for the herd to migrate from the Dragon's Den, as a home less famous for having something valuable is objectively safer. As of now though, Kingdra feels he's too unfit to lead anyone, and would much rather pledge his power to a proper chieftain. It then uses his dragon type energy to levitate out of the water and bow his head to Ash as a gesture of surrender to capture. Ash looks between his companions for input, as Meowth jokes that he won't be the only one calling the kid boss, while Mewtwo expresses that he will be very disappointed if Ash refused such a heartfelt request. So with that, Ash produces one of the Ultra Balls that Sabrina had originally given him to steal away Mewtwo if need be, and adds Kingdra to his team as his ninth edition. With a sad smile, he sighs it looks like he caught a Kingdra, as Mewtwo teleports them away from the scene. Upon returning back to Annabelle's, filling her in and calming her down, Ash reflects on his day, and suddenly gets the urge to show Mewtwo the opposite side of the spectrum of humanity, asking if he thinks he can help him check in on his friends and family. Curiously, the clone agrees, and along with Meowth, Psyduck, and Ash's egg, they sit and quietly link their minds, as Mewtwo uses Ash as a router of sorts to basically link back to those he has connections with, allowing him to project his and Ash's consciousness into minds of others. The egg had made Ash think of the man he thinks of as an older brother, and so his first vision is of Brock, currently hard at work at mixing medicines together with Bulbasaur under the watch of an old, sagey looking man with a sleeping Venusaur. Next is obviously a vision of Misty, who he sees as returns to the Cerulean gym for what looks like some rather intense training of her own. Richie is in a location that Ash slowly realizes is actually the remains of a new island. The area is deserted, however except for Dune and an older looking gentleman with an intense vibe. Silver is currently traveling, his newly acquired Eevee accompanying him outside of his ball and being cradle leveling in the once cold hearted trainer's arms. Though along with him is a man Ash doesn't recognize. The guy is pretty weirdly handsome though. And before they leave, Silver gets a chill as Mewtwo and Ash move on, almost as if he too can sense them. Gary is actually just packing a bag, which is fairly mundane. However, before Mewtwo flips the proverbial channel, Ash stops him as his jaw drops when he sees Lance walk into the same room as the boy before the two speak and leave together. Making Ash a bit jealous, Gary seems to be getting his own little road trip with his hero. He checks on a few others like Giselle, AJ, and the like, but this is really all in an effort to stall himself from checking on the one person he had been most worried about, his mom. The vision of his home is a somber one. The house is in a state of disevelment. Ash 
wasn't even aware his mother could endure, though the reason is very clear, as when he lay eyes on his mother, he can instantly tell the news of what happened to him has been devastating without even looking into her vacant and soulless eyes. This is traumatic enough to cause Ash to scramble from the room in order to reach Annabelle's video phone. He'd refuse to use it up at this point, in fear of making contact with his mom could end terribly, but he cannot and will not leave her in such a state. He calls, but there's no answer. On his second and third tries, the result is still the same. All are ignored until the fifth as he finally gets through. And there she is, his mother sat across the other side of the screen and is now able to see him alive and well. His voice dies in his throat as he struggles with what to say and wonders what she'll say. Will she be mad? Will she cry more? Or think he's a ghost? Will she notice how much bigger he's gotten? But what he receives is nothing, just an empty, blank look. Scared by this, Ash begins to frantically call for his mom to respond until a chill runs up his spine as a hand lands over her shoulder off screen. Then slowly, Giovanni himself steps from off the screen and Six next to Delia with a very self-satisfied smirk as he casually drapes his arm across the catatomic woman's shoulder and smugly greets Ash with the friendly yet somehow menacing, hey kiddo. The boy's eyes widen as he shoots from his chair in anger, nearly screaming the man's name. However, a pair of yellow eyes peering from behind Giovanni and his mother stop him in his tracks as he realizes that Persian could do a lot of damage if Giovanni so pleased. Balling his fists, he sits back down and through gritted teeth demands to know what Giovanni is doing there, what he wants and what has he done to his mother. The mobster waves the boy's anger off, stating that hypnosis is far more effective than some realizing. Putting opponents to sleep is one thing, but making them obey your every whim is an entirely different one. But the sight of the man's hands touching his mother's face in such an intimate manner causes a statement to cross the boy's lip he thought he would never say. I will bury you, old man. This seems to spoil Gio's fun, as he rudely shoves Delia away and gets to the point, declaring that no matter what Ash does, he is his property, pointing out that he would have been a fool not to have any contingencies for dealing with a bunch of kids and teenagers, hence why his contingencies have contingencies. As he asks how Mewtwo is doing, Ash's eye twitches as he tries not to reveal his cards, but the boss sees through this and takes his silence as confirmation that the clone is not only doing well, but he's gotten close with Ash, something Geo is unsettling pleased to learn as he raises a tablet in his hand and presses something on the screen. Suddenly, a searing pain begins to flare in Ash's arm, and he is forced to clutch it in agony. As horrifyingly, his flesh begins to bubble and swell uncontrollably, the pain being potent enough that Ash falls out of his chair and arrives on the floor as he almost wishes someone would just come along and take the arm off in total. But as soon as it comes, it goes. And when he looks back to it, his arm appears as if nothing has happened. Shakily, the terrified boy stammers out a demand for his former mentor to explain, and the cunning man is all too happy to. Asking if Ash really thought that he used his and the other boy's DNA to fill in the gaps of Mewtwo's eroded cells for the fun of it. That too, obviously was a contingency, and a double-sided one on that. This is the Rocket Boss's failsafe. At any time, he can activate a process which will cause the cells of those connected to Mewtwo to seek the clone out and be absorbed by him. That way, he would always have a way to locate and subjugate the world's strongest Pokemon weapon, and the fools unlucky enough to be tied to it will forever be forced to be his loyal executioner, wielding that weapon to carry out the will of Team Rocket. Tears begin to well in Ash's eyes as his sense of freedom is going all too quickly, but his sponsor assures him that he would never do that to Ash, obviously, in the full warm tone that he used to recruit him, because he knows it would be so much more effective to do it to Richie and Silver, slowly, painfully, and while he was sure that Ash would see every single moment of it. And while he's at it, he may as well throw the kid's precious mother into the mix as well, since in his eyes, disobedience warrants the harshest of punishments. Ash hangs his head in defeat as tears flow down his face, and shakily, he asks what is needed of him. Kicking himself when subconsciously, he slips back to calling him Mr. Giovanni. This earns him a pleasant grin and a condescending query on what was so hard about that, all while the man disrespectfully toys with his hypnotized mother's auburn hair. The boss's orders are quite simple. He wants Ash to take some time to clear his head and really think about his conversation and what he has to gain by cooperating, as well as what he has to lose. Having guessed that the boy would have already spent his time training, he reveals that he's arranged a little present for his protege since his birthday is coming up. He orders Ash to take a small vacation and mentions that that he's already sent them some gifts, a ticket to a cruise ship owned by an associate of his which puts the SSN to shame, and a brand new Pokédex, one he hopes Ash will be more gentle with seeing as how he'd even gone to the trouble of disabling its home return feature, meaning with it, Ash can switch his on-hand team of six on the fly with but the press of a few buttons, much more than he currently thought his ungrateful student deserved. With that, Giovanni simply says that they will talk again very soon, before he cuts their communication, leaving Ash alone to process all of his thoughts, as his now thoroughly shaken spirit questions what the future will hold.
that's all we have for this part. But I'm a little confused. As a matter of fact, I have a question. Hey, plus, what's up with that ticket? You mean the one Geo gave Ash? Yeah, it's strange that he would want to send him on a vacation with everything that's been going on. Don't you think Giovanni would be afraid Ash would take this chance to run? No, oh, come on, Ro. You know Giovanni is way smarter than you give him credit for. The guy literally always has a plan. Even if we don't know exactly where he's shipping Ash off to, we can assume be big. I don't know. I just don't get it. Something seems off. <sighs> I suppose I knew you wouldn't be patient enough to leave this as a surprise, so we may as well have them come on out and show themselves. Yo, newbies, you're up. I guess that's our cue. Hey everyone, I'm Dex Comics. And I'm Pickle Dill. Plus and Ronan have invited us to join them in taking the next big step for the GSA universe. A brand new story set in the Hoenn region, featuring characters you know and love like Ash and Meowth, as well as a few new faces. Don't worry though, we'll be back in Kanto in a few weeks to continue their journey. But first, there's a few adventures we need to have in Hoenn, which will make their vacation anything but relaxing. Hope, Hope to, to see, see you there! You there.